Tonight on Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte forms a committee to draw up evacuation plans of overseas Filipino workers in the Middle East. The House of Representatives awaits formal communication from Malacanang for Congress to convene amid the Middle East conflict. President Duterte to side with the United States if Filipinos in the Middle East are harmed due to escalating tensions in the region. Philippine National Police refutes Vice President Lenny Robredo's claim that the government's drug war was a failure. And Philippine officials advise Filipinos not to travel to Australia for the meantime amid raging bushfires. Good evening. The Philippine government will prioritize the evacuation of Filipinos near American military bases in Iraq, should the need arise. A special envoy to the Middle East recommends to elevate the alert level in Iraq to level 4. Ray Pelayo explains why. I will do my best to do another mission for our country. Department of Environment and Natural Resources Secretary Roy Simatu has been designated by President Rodrigo Duterte to lead the repatriation of Filipino workers in some parts of Middle East in case the tension between the United States of America and Iran increases. Simatu was the Philippines' special envoy to the Middle East in 2003 when the U.S. invaded Iraq. The official will fly to the Middle East right after obtaining the necessary documents. I plan to go to Qatar, establish our base there, and uh, from there we will uh, see if we will be able to go inside uh, Iraq. Simato recommends the elevation of the alert level in Iraq from level 3 to level 4, which means that a mandatory or forced evacuation will be implemented. There are U.S. military bases in Iraq which might be attacked by Iranian forces. We have to move out immediately the Filipinos out of Iraq uh, because uh, I believe that uh, this, this could be the target initially to the uh, U.S. facilities inside Baghdad, almost the same uh, area where the Iranian general was killed. The Secretary says the government will prioritize the repatriation of Filipinos near U.S. military facilities. The U.S. also has military bases in Qatar, Bahrain, and Kuwait. And the best uh, way for the moment is for them to leave Iraq immediately. The government has sent personnel to Iran to find out the situation of Filipinos there. One of the challenges Simato is anticipating is tracing undocumented OFWs in Iran. Secretary Simato appeals to Filipinos with relatives working or staying in Iran to help locate their loved ones. Yung parents na Manila rito, yan ngayon magsasabi that they are there. Sa so ito yung mga sources namin kung saan talaga sila. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The House of Representatives awaits the formal communication from Malacanang to convene in a special session together with the Upper House of Congress as tension in the Middle East escalates. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. President Rodrigo Duterte urges the Senate and the House of Representatives to convene in a special session in order to come up with contingency funds should the mass repatriation of OFWs in the Middle East commence. According to the President, as there are millions of Filipinos in the Middle East, a gargantuan amount may be needed to repatriate them should there be turmoil in the Middle East due to the tension from U.S. and Iran. We have so many millions, nearing three, I think, of Filipinos working mainly in the Middle East. Kinakabahan ako. Uh, Iran seems to be head, uh, bent on uh, irritation, which I think will come. It's a matter of time. I, I do not have anything. Nari worry. Were it not for the fact there are a lot of Filipinos there. And it would take us a huge gargantum effort just in case 
total uh, breaks out of how to bring them back safely. According to House Majority Floor Leader Martin Romualdez, the House of Representatives is ready to accept the President's request to convene in a special session to help map out contingency plans related to the ongoing tension in the Middle East. Romualdez adds the lower house is just awaiting the formal communication coming from Malacanang. Under Section 87, Rule 11 of the House Rules, the Speaker, in consultation with the majority and minority leaders and their Senate counterparts, may convene the House in session at any time during a recess or between sessions to consider urgent legislative matters or concerns. Pero Romualdez House Speaker Alan Peter Caetano has tasked the House Secretariat to make the necessary preparations for the special session. Congressman Bonito Singson of the Minority Bloc also assures they will heed the call and support the President to prioritize the safety of OFWs at risk in the Middle East. Singson in a statement says he will be in contact with Minority Leader Benny Abante to make sure the Minority Bloc will be active in crafting measures needed to address the impact of the U.S.-Iran tension. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Amid the rising tensions in the Middle East, where millions of documented Filipinos are working, President Rodrigo Duterte will side with the U.S. should Iran involve Filipinos in the conflict. Rosalie Cos reports why. Filipino workers in the Middle East is the Duterte administration's foremost priority. According to Presidential Spokesperson and Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Salvador Panelo, if Iran involves Filipinos in the Middle East in its conflict with the United States of America, President Rodrigo Duterte will side with the U.S. The Philippines is a longtime ally of America. The chief executive has immediately sent his representative to speak with the Iranian and Iraqi governments through presidential advisor on overseas Filipino workers, Abdullah Mamao. This is to relay the president's special message on the safety of the Filipinos working in the two Middle Eastern countries. President Duterte wants no Filipinos harmed in the course of the ongoing conflicts between the U.S. and Iran. The president was very specific in saying last night, that if the Filipinos are harmed, he will side with the Americans. It is a different issue, however, if the U.S. forces will be the ones to place Filipinos in the Middle East at risk. In case this happens, the decision on what step to take depends on President Duterte, says Malacanang. Idamay yung mga Pilipino niya sa away niya sa Amerika. So, ibang, iba Kasi, pa... Kasi, di ba, we're supposed to be allies of the Americans. And, <coughs> yung enemies might also attack not only the Americans, but the allies of the Americans. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. The Philippines may opt not to send soldiers as support forces for the United States fight against Iran. This is despite a treaty between the Philippines and the U.S. signed in 1950, 1961. Arlene Delgado explains why. Defense Secretary Delfin Lorenzana has said the Philippines is not obliged to send troops for the United States should the U.S. ask for help. This as the Mutual Defense Treaty signed in 1951, which until now is in effect, covers only the conflicts within the Asia-Pacific region. Article 4 of the treaty states that both countries will support each other should there be an armed attack on either of the parties in the Pacific area. To send or not to send forces to support the U.S., such determination is up to the Congress, according to security analyst Professor Romel Banlawi. Matindi yung makaharapin na pagsubok dyan ng Pilipinas dahil kung uh, sakali mag-deteriorate yung uh, conflict between U.S. and Iran, isa sa mga pwedeng lapitan ng uh, status of ito, kaya Pilipinas, ibas na pag mutual defense. Kailangan pa rin na uh, mag-decide dyan ang uh, kongreso. Kasi hindi naman automatic yan na kung sakasakaling uh, hinantay ng tulong ng Amerika ay uh, agad-agarang mag-deploy na tayo ng ating mga military troops. Banlawi adds the move will depend on President Rodrigo Duterte's position on which ally to side with. The Philippines has other two big nation allies aside from the U.S., Russia and China, which, on the other hand, are allies of Iran. 
kaya dapat mapinpala natin po ano yung uh, sentimiento ng Russia at China at ano maging overall impact ng desisyon natin kung sakasakali mga mag-decide ang ating pamahalaan na tulungan ang Amerika dito. Nagkaroon ng Iraq War, nag-participate tayo diyan. Nung nagkaroon ng war sa Afghanistan, nag-participate din ang Pilipinas diyan. In fact, no noong pa, Vietnam War, Korean War, so meron tayo na track record na tumutulong sa status dito. But should Iran decide to target all U.S. allies, Manawi is positive the Philippines will be spared given its good economic and cultural relations with Iran. The security analyst also explains the public must not fear that World War III might be prompted by the rising tensions between the United States and Iran. So, maraming mga prevent, preventive mechanism para maiwasan ang World War III. Kaya dapat uh, matindi natin reaction ng mga publiko na huwag mag-overreact sa issue na to at huwag i-overblow yung uh, situation. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue, Kazan City. Philippine National Police does not agree with Vice President Lenny Robredo who reports that the government's war on drugs is a massive failure. Lea Ilagan tells us why. The Philippine National Police or PNP do not subscribe to the bombshell drop by Vice President Lenny Robredo that the government's national anti-drug campaign is a massive failure. PNP officer in charge, Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa stands firm. They have 100% accomplishments in the anti-illegal drug war and not 1% as what VP Lenny claims. Gamboa stresses that the authorities have abolished 14 clandestine shabu laboratories and 419 drug dens since 2016. Since 2016, the PNP have also confiscated 5.1 tons of shabu, 2.3 tons of marijuana, 500 kilograms of cocaine, and more than 42,000 pieces of ecstasy, with an estimated worth of 40.39 billion pesos since 2016. From that year, 220,000 drug personalities have been arrested, more than 8,000 of which are high-value targets. Meanwhile, more than 5,000 drug personalities and 55 policemen were killed due to the government's drug war. More than 16,000 barangays nationwide are now drug-free. Ang ginawa niya, kinuha niya yung, kinote niya yung pideg, no? that there are three tons uh, consumption per week for the drug uh, problem in the in the in the Philippines and then inequate niya ito doon sa drugs recovered no yung appreciation niya doon sa statistics na yon is wrong dahil ganun yung appreciation niya it's quite risky because if you have na little knowledge on the statistics that you present it could be very risky and it is not even mathematically acceptable. Gamboa adds 18 days as co-chair of the Interagency Committee on Illegal Drugs or ICAD is not enough to come up with the estimates of the whole anti-illegal drugs campaign of the government. What's the general situation of the crime now since 2016? It had declined since then. Eight out of ten Filipinos believe on the success. How can he claim on that very simple statistics that she is now presenting na failure yung aming campaign against illegal drugs? The PNP OIC's order of massive drive against illegal drugs, terrorism, crimes, and corruption still stands. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Kam Krame. A Philippine Deputy Consul General to Victoria advises the public not to travel to Australia for the meantime. The official said that over 300 Filipinos who live near the area being devastated by the fires have already been evacuated. Nina Bascon will tell us why. The winter bushfires in Australia are unprecedented and the worst calamity to strike the country. Though authorities are hoping the situation will not be permanent, Philippine Deputy Consul General to Victoria Anthony Andap discourages Filipinos for the meantime to travel to Australia. The official also advises Filipinos who are down under to stay alert and vigilant about the situation. Right now, we are not encouraging them to travel to Australia. But uh, we are hoping that this is just a temporary situation. And uh, when things settle down and... Uh, uh, things are restored to normalcy. 
pursue uh, the, 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 for sure the same opportunities uh, will be present for them. Deputy Consul General Andap also reports around 300 Filipinos or 50 to 100 families have already been evacuated from East Gippsland, one of the areas most devastated by the bushfire. Most of them are permanent residents and Australian citizens. Five families are confirmed to have lost their homes and properties to the raging fires. The Philippine government assures help has been extended to those Filipino families and other calamity victims. Of course, to ascertain the condition of our clients and see to it that they are safely evacuated and second, that they get uh, the relief assistance that they need. The Philippine consulates in Australia update their contingency measures for Filipinos in case the situation here worsens. Among the Filipinos who decided to evacuate from Udonga, Victoria is Mr. Ray Clementer. I'm going to go to Udonga because 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 Sa lugar namin, kasi 30 minutes na lang, actually nakikita na namin yung sunog sa harap ng bahay namin eh. Kaya umalis na po kami. Malacanang vows the government will give assistance to any Filipino affected by the devastation brought about by the bushfires which began in September last year. Officials from the Philippines are set to visit Melbourne this week to monitor the condition and situation of Filipino evacuees. The embassy also said they are ready to repatriate Filipinos who would request to be sent home. Nina Bascon, UN TV News and Rescue, Australia. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I am William Theo, and here are the headlines. Malacanang says President Rodrigo Duterte offers new contracts to Manila Water and Maynila. A law expert says the contract to build the Kaliwa Dam project must be pushed through due to the issue of necessity. The Philippines Bureau of Immigration implements partial deployment ban of Filipino workers to Kuwait. Angkas faces blacklist for operating outside of designated pilot areas. And know why you should not abbreviate the year 2020 when signing checks or legal documents. Good evening. The government has come up with new contracts without the onerous provisions in the 1997 water concession deals. President Rodrigo Duterte offers the new contracts to Maynilad Water Services and Manila Water, but Malacanang says the options of accepting the new contracts is without any guarantee of not being criminally prosecuted for violating the Constitution. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. The issue on the water concession agreements entered into by the government with the two biggest water distributors in Metro Manila was among the topics extensively discussed in President Rodrigo Duterte's cabinet meeting Monday night. The Office of the Solicitor General, together with the Department of Justice, presented the new water contracts in which the onerous provisions in the 1997 water concession agreements have been removed. According to Malacanang, the chief executive is offering the new contracts to Manila Water Services and Manila Water Company. The chief executive is giving the water concessioners the option of accepting the new contracts without any guarantee of not being criminally prosecuted together with those who conspired to craft the very onerous contracts which are, as we have many times said and as the president described it, void of initial or void from the very beginning for violating the constitution and the laws of the land. The government is not providing a timeline for the two water concessionaires regarding the new contract. Should Manila and Manila Water refuse to accept the new agreements, the president will order the cancellation of their present water contracts order the nationalization of water services in their respective areas of operation and prosecuted 
or and prosecute rather all those involved directly or indirectly in the arrangement that led to the present suffering of the Filipino people. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. The contract entered into by the Philippine government with China to execute the Kaliwa Dam project must be pushed through according to a law expert. But the lawyer agrees there are a few onerous provisions in the loan agreement. Dante Amento tells us why. President Rodrigo Duterte has allowed to continue the government spending contract with China on the construction of the 12 billion peso Kaliwa Dam project under a commercial loan contract. The project aims to augment the high demand for water supply in Metro Manila. The president in December warned judges not to interfere by issuing a temporary restraining order on the implementation of the project. I'm warning the judge, judges that be sparing about issuing TRO. Otherwise, I will publicly announce that do not follow. You follow the program of government. For Attorney George Irwin Garcia, the Dean of Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Manila's College of Law, the government should continue to implement the contract signed by the Philippines and China in November 20, 2018. He says this is due to the undeniable reality of high demand for water in Metro Manila, which cannot be supplied even by the major source, the Angat Dam. Para sa akin, no choice tayo eh. Push to the wall ang ating bansa, ang ating mga mamamayan. Uh, sabihin mo na na bitter pill, isang napakapait na, na gamot. Eh, kinakailangan talaga natin kasi ng mga gantong klaseng project ngayon. But some groups like Bayan Muna of the Makabayan Bloc in the lower chamber of Congress are against the contract. In particular, they are against five provisions in the contract which they describe as disastrous, one-sided or onerous and favors China. For one, Article 5.7 which states the Philippines or any of its assets is not entitled to any right of immunity in case China has claimed the Philippines. But Attorney Garcia explains, such is a wrong interpretation. Kaya lang kinwalify siya. Di ba may qualification siya yung 5.7 na yun. At yung qualification na kalagay, unless it is prohibited by the law o ba? or any other, any other decisions of the Supreme Court. Another is Article 8.1, with which Bayan Muna believes that the Philippines irrevocably waived any immunity on grounds of sovereignty. On this, Attorney Garcia explains that any country which enters into an agreement with another country has the right to file a complaint if a part of a contract is not followed, especially a commercial contract like the Kaliwa Dam project. The lawyer says, however, that he believes the three other provisions which Bayan Muna opposes are indeed onerous or disadvantageous for the Philippines, so they must be reviewed or taken out. Article 8.4, which state that the agreement as well as the rights and obligations of the parties shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of China. Article 8.5, using the Hong Kong International Arbitration Court for any dispute. Article 8.9, which says the terms, conditions and the standard of fees of loan agreement will be confidential. For Attorney Garcia, this is against the freedom of information, especially that what will be used to pay the loan is the people's money. Attorney Garcia adds, the government must listen to stakeholders who will be affected by the implementation of the project, such as the indigenous people and the environment sector. The agreement that mag will govern sa usapan, ayusin na kaagad. Hindi yung after 10 years, 20 years, meron na namang isang pangulo na biglang sasabi, ay mali ang pinasok ng Duterte administration sa kontratang yan. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. In other news, Filipinos heading for Kuwait to work there for the first time are not allowed to travel to the Gulf state coming from any ports in the country. Aiko Miguel reports why. The Bureau of Immigration on Friday began to execute its part in the government's strict implementation of a deployment ban of newly hired domestic workers to Kuwait. We are instructing all immigration officers na yung mga first-timer na ating mga OFWs papuntang Kuwait ay ban. Hindi po sila pwedeng pumunta or payagan na makapunta dun sa, sa Kuwait. 
The Bureau received a copy of the January 3 resolution from the Governing Board of the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration or POEA. The ban includes not only first-time hirees but also domestic workers returning to Kuwait or Balik Magagawa but have no existing employment contract there. The Bureau of Immigration clarifies, however, it will allow the departure of domestic workers who are in the Philippines for vacation and have an existing contract in Kuwait. Domestic workers issued with an overseas employment certificate before January 3 are also allowed to be deployed to Kuwait. The Bureau warns local recruitment agencies not to attempt to circumvent the ban and force to deploy domestic workers to the Gulf state. Despite the partial ban, a group of workers is pushing for a total deployment ban of domestic workers to Kuwait. According to the Trade Union Congress of the Philippines or TUCP, the agreement on OFW deployment between the Philippines and Kuwait is not being followed. Based on data the group has gathered, 200 OFWs died in Kuwait in four years. They have also listed 30 cold cases of OFW suicides. Meanwhile, the Bureau of Immigration is prepared to implement any changes in the government's foreign policy or OFW deployment. Should the Department of Foreign Affairs or the Labor Department impose any new ban to Iraq, Iran, and Libya? Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Meanwhile, Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello III confirms they have received the autopsy report on the remains of Janelin Villavende, the domestic worker who died in Kuwait in December last year. Based on the post-mortem examination report from the Kuwait government, Villavende died on December 28 due to acute failure of heart and respiration as a result of shock and multiple injuries. According to Secretary Bello, this is a confirmation the Filipina worker was beaten to death. The Labor Chief requests the National Bureau of Investigation for a separate autopsy on Villavende's remains. The Philippine Embassy in Paris has issued an advisory to warn Filipinos visiting and living in France, particularly in the capital city. Tensions continue as angry transport workers launch massive protests against the government, crippling major transportation across Paris. Announcements of massive strikes on January 9 and 10 have reached the embassy. Thus, it advised the Filipino community there to be aware of the situation and prepare for alternative means to go to work as travel disruptions are again expected. Meanwhile, embassy officials also expressed concern over the growing number of Filipinos being victimized by burglars and thieves, particularly tourists. Paris ranked 14th among the countries in the world with a moderate to high index of crimes in the past three years, according to the 2019 Crime Rate Index, published by research website Nambeo.com. This has prompted the embassy to remind Filipinos traveling and living, particularly in the capital city, to be extra vigilant and alert at all times. The Philippine Embassy in Paris can be reached through its 24-7 hotline numbers at uh, 3362-0592-515 or through its official social media accounts, hashtag FinFrance. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, is optimistic the court will rule in favor of the implementation of the provincial bus ban on EDSA. But for now, it has to wait for the resolution of the Quezon City Regional Trial Court on the said case. Joa Nano tells us why. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, is yet to proceed with the implementation of provincial bus ban on EDSA. This is despite the decision of the Supreme Court jungling the three petitions filed against the provincial bus ban. Based on the SE ruling, those petitions should be filed in lower courts such as regional trial courts or the Court of Appeals and not in the highest court in the country. The MMDA explains it cannot proceed with the ban as of now because the writ of preliminary injunction issued by the Quezon City Regional Trial Court remains in effect. MMDA EDSA Traffic Chief Edison Bongnebiha emphasizes the SC decision is a welcome development. The official believes this would be the MMDA's advantage for them to be finally allowed to implement the proposed policy. We will be fighting this in one court lang for us. It is uh, somehow sort of victory because one less uh, burden on our part. 
The Office of the Solicitor General, who stands as the MMDA's legal counsel, has earlier filed a motion for reconsideration for the Quezon City Regional Trial Court to review the case. As of now, the MMD is still waiting for the court's resolution on whether it would lift the injunction on the suggested implementation of the provincial bus ban in Metro Manila's busiest thoroughfare. The agency remains optimistic that the court will eventually allow the implementation of the provincial bus ban, which it sees as one of the primary solutions to ease the worsening traffic on EDSA. So, uh, sana naman, uh, Joan Arnold, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. And to complete the most significant news for this day, Why News continues. Here are the top stories. Motorcycle ride hailing service Ancas may be blacklisted from the pilot test run for motorcycle taxis. Joe Anano tells us why. Authorities have apprehended several motorcycle riders who are said to be members of Ancas operating in Cagayan de Oro City. Such is a clear violation of the guidelines that motorcycle taxis are allowed to operate only in Metro Manila and Metro Cebu, according to the Technical Working Group of the Department of Transportation. Following the apprehension, the DOTRTWG says it is possible for ANCAS to be blacklisted from the pilot test run for motorcycle taxis. Apart from their alleged colorum operation, another violation that TWG cites is adding search in their fare of their riders. Search is a component in fare computation among app-based transportation services, which is based on the demand and supply of vehicles against ridership. It is also based on the time and traffic situation. But under the ongoing pilot test run, motorcycle taxis are not allowed to add surge in their fares, according to DOTR TWG Chairman and LTFRB Board Member Antonio Garjola. Uh, yung angkas po ay nag-charge pa ng surge, ano, clearly violating the guidelines of the TWG. The pilot test run of motorcycle taxis will end on March 23rd, after which, the TWG will submit its recommendation to the Congress by April 18. The TWG also emphasizes it will terminate the operations of all motorcycle taxis after the pilot test run. Whether or not their operation can continue depends on the Congress decision. John Anano, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Meanwhile, losing vice presidential bet and former Senator Bongbong Marcos is asking the Supreme Court to re-examine, review, and reconsider the result of the pilot recount in his election protest against Vice President Lenny Robredo. In his memorandum filed with the SC, which sits as the Presidential Electoral Tribunal, Marcos argued the PET should not have counted the rejected ballots in Robredo's favor. Marcos also said the tribunal should proceed with the third cause of action in his electoral protest, the nullification of election results in the provinces of Maguindanao, Lanao del Sur, and Basilan due to massive fraud and vote buying during the 2016 elections. Robredo, on the other hand, sought the immediate dismissal of Marcos's protest, arguing he failed to recover a substantial number of votes in the pilot recount. In 2016 elections, Robredo beat Marcos with a margin of over 260,000 votes. And for the news abroad, here's Kath Dumaraos reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. Kath, good evening. Good evening, William. Huge crowds have packed the streets of the Iranian capital, Tehran, for the funeral of military commander Qasem Soleimani. Meanwhile, the United States on Monday sent mixed messages about the presence of its troops in Iraq as a letter from the military to Baghdad, which appeared to signal a withdrawal of troops was leaked. Beverly Saison details this report. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper has denied U.S. troops are pulling out of Iraq after a letter from a U.S. general there suggested a withdrawal. The letter said the U.S. would be repositioning forces in the coming days and weeks after Iraqi MPS had called for them to leave. Esper said there had been no decision whatsoever to leave. Head of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley told reporters that the letter was a draft regarding troop movement coordination that was a mistake that should not have been sent. 
Pentagon Press Secretary Alyssa Ferris said on Twitter that there has been no change to U.S. policy on force presence in Iraq and reaffirmed Washington's commitment to the coalition and ensuring a safe, secure, and prosperous future for the Iraqi people. Iraq's outgoing Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi asked U.S. Ambassador in Baghdad Matthew Tuller Monday to work together to execute the withdrawal of foreign troops deployed in Iraq as approved by the Iraqi parliament on Sunday. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tried to reduce tensions by assuring in a meeting with the Saudi Deputy Minister of Defense Khalid bin Salman that his country has no intention of starting a war with Iran. Meanwhile, between gestures of grief and pain, hundreds of thousands of mourners packed into the streets of Tehran on Monday called for vengeance following the United States assassination of top Iranian general Qasem Soleimani. Men and women of all ages sobbed and shouted, death to America, death to Israel, and death to the Saudi royals. As the vast funeral crowd made its way down a central Tehran Avenue to pay their final tributes to the revered military figure. Soleimani's death in a U.S. bombing outside Baghdad's international airport on Friday was compared by many in the crowd to the martyrdom of the third Imam of Shia Islam, Al Hussein ibn Ali, who was killed in the Battle of Karbala in present day Iraq in the year 680. Beverly Saison, UNTV News and Rescue. Australian firefighters used cool weather on Tuesday to try to strengthen containment lines around almost 200 wildfires burning in the country's southeast as Prime Minister Scott Morrison prepared to meet with insurance and bank executives to discuss the crisis. Elsie Marcus reports why. Australia firefighters Tuesday took advantage of improved weather conditions to bolster preparations against the nearly 200 fires that continued to burn in the country's southeast following months of ongoing struggles to control them. Australia's weather service expects rains and comparatively moderate temperatures to remain until Thursday, bringing respite to firefighters and providing an opportunity to contain the fires before conditions worsen again toward the weekend. The state of New South Wales has been the worst affected by the bushfires, where 20 of the total 25 deaths recorded so far have occurred. Some 2,600 firefighters are working to extinguish or check the spread of some 130 blazes that remain active in that area. According to RFS, 1,588 houses have been destroyed in New South Wales since the fires began in September. However, the organization warned the number would increase as more affected areas were accessed. In Victoria, where alert levels were brought down thanks to the rain, Premier Daniel Andrews pegged the number of houses burned to at least 200. Another 100 have been charged countrywide. The Insurance Council of Australia said Tuesday a total 700 million Australian dollars or 485 million of accumulated damages have been recorded since September with nearly 9,000 fire-related claims. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, heavily criticized for his handling of the crisis, announced Monday a package of two billion Australian dollars over the next two years to finance the recovery of affected areas. The fires, considered among the worst of the century in Australia, have burned at least six million hectares of land, equivalent to twice the area of Belgium. Meanwhile, the smoke from the extensive wildfires in Australia arrived in Chile on Monday after traveling more than 11,000 kilometers over the Pacific Ocean. A meteorological trough, a barometric depression that penetrates between two zones of high atmospheric pressure, is suspected to have been the conduit through which the smoke crossed the Pacific to the South American continent. The presence of smoke should not cause any serious effect in the South American nation, since it rarely rains in that area. L.C. Marcus, UNTV News and Rescue. 
Japan has renewed its call for Lebanon to return fugitive ex Nissan boss Carlos Gosen. Lebanon does not typically surrender its citizens, but Japan says it can request his extradition. According to reports, Gosen walked out of his house on the 29th of December before boarding a bullet train to Osaka. He was then reportedly smuggled out of the country in a flight case, usually used to transport musical equipment. Privacy rights defenders in Privacy rights defenders in India expressed concern over the government's plan to develop one of the world's largest facial recognition programs. Details in this report. India's ambitions to develop one of the world's largest facial recognition programs has sparked concerns among defenders of privacy rights that the country is tittering towards mass surveillance amid widespread protests. Prime Minister Narendra Modi tried to soothe the country's unrest at an event held in New Delhi two weeks ago as authorities continue to grapple demonstrations over a controversial citizenship bill that would grant rights to minorities from neighboring Islamic nations but exclude Muslims. Thousands of people came to see the Hindu nationalist PM in person but soon realized they too were being observed. One police official involved with the security arrangement at the event said each attendee at the rally was caught on camera at the metal detector gate and a live feed from there was matched with a facial data set within five seconds at the control room set up at the venue. Authorities said the measures were adopted to pick up potential security threats. The National Crime Records Bureau, an interior ministry agency, has called for a facial recognition program to be rolled out across the whole of India, which is home to some 1.3 billion people. The technology is already up and running in New Delhi, where police got access to it in 2018 with the original purpose of locating missing children. Two days before Modi's speech last December 20, several white police drones flew over crowds of protesters, voicing their anger about the proposed citizenship law outside one of India's largest mosques, the Jama Masjid in Old Delhi. For defenders of privacy, the drones and the facial recognition program come as something of a nightmare. Although the Indian Supreme Court recognizes privacy as a fundamental right, the country does not yet have legislation in this regard and a law on the protection of personal data is still pending approval by Parliament. Kat Numaraos, TV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Kat Numaraos, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. The Bible Readers of Bread Society International has begun its month-long Bible reading activity. This time's a bit different, though. Nina Armilio tells us why. It's the National Bible Month this January. And true to its name, the organization Bible Readers, or Bread Society International, leads in reading the Holy Scriptures. And this time, it's online, so everyone can join. Saan naroon ay pinanganap na hari ng mga Hudyo sapagat aming nakita ang kanyang bituin sa silanganan at naparito kami upang siya'y sambahin. At may isang pamigis na kanan sa labaliwot ng kanyang baywa at ang kanyang pagkain ay mga baalang at tulog o gluta. Sa katotohan ay pinabautismo at kumayo sa tubig sa pagsisisi. Tatapuan ang gumarating sa ulihan ay dahil lalong makapangyarihan kay sa akin na hindi ako karapat dapat magdala ng kanyang pangyaba. Siya ang sa inyo ay magbabautismo sa Espiritu Santo at Apoy. On its Facebook page, the group invites netizens to join reading a chapter of the Bible a day. This Bible reading activity commenced with Matthew chapter 1 on January 1st. Ang aklat ng lahi ni Yesus Christ, na anak ni David, na anak ni Abraham, naging anak ni Abraham si Isaac, at naging anak ni Isaac si Abraham, at naging anak ni Abraham si Huda, at naging anak ni Huda kay Tamar si Paris at si Sarah, at naging anak ni Paris si Esro, at naging anak ni Esro si Abraham. Such endeavor is in accordance with Presidential Proclamation Number 124, which declares January of every year the National Bible Month, culminating in the last week of January as the National Bible Week in the country. It was signed by President Rodrigo Duterte on January 5, 2017. 
According to the proclamation, it is fitting and proper for the molding of the spiritual, moral, and social fiber of our citizenry that national attention be focused on the importance of reading and studying the Bible. Bread Society International also offers free services to download Omega Digi Bible app, which is available for both Android and iOS users. Watch out for Bread's invitation on its Facebook page to read another chapter daily this month in the afternoon or evening Philippine time. Bread Society is a non-profit, non-sectarian group known for rendering free services in schools and universities like free haircut and free printing, free coffee, free rides, jail visits, and gift giving to those in need. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. Experts advise the public to write dates in the year 2020 in full, especially when signing legal documents and checks. According to attorney Georgia Garcia, pamantasa ng lunsod ng Maynilas College of Law Dean, dates that are abbreviated may leave people vulnerable to fraud. Attorney Garcia explains some manipulators may change the year of the date by adding two more digits after the numbers 2 and 0 or shortened form of 2020. The lawyer also recommends to always secure a receiving copy of a receipt or any document. Be sure a witness is present when signing legal papers. Meanwhile, financial expert Ninang Riza Muyot advises one can take a photo of the signed check for evidence. Violators may face criminal charges for falsification of documents with up to six years of imprisonment as penalty. Ang pinakamaganda rin siguro, bago yung uh, after, yung after the fact, siguro ang pinakamaganda, especially kung may gagawin tayong dokumento, always make a, uh, a second copy. At mas maganda rin na maingat lang tayo para maiwasan natin yung maganyang klaseng kaso at maganyang klaseng problema. And those are the reasons behind the news of this January 7, 2020. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. We have to move out immediately the Filipinos out of Iraq. Uh, because uh, I believe that uh, this, this could be the target initially because uh, U.S. facilities inside Baghdad, almost the same uh, area where the Iranian general was killed. The president was very specific in saying last night that if the Filipinos are harmed, he will side with the Americans. We are instructing all immigration officers na yung mga first-timer na ating mga OFWs papuntang Kuwait ay ipan. Hindi po sila pwede pumunta o payagan na makapunta dun sa, sa Kuwait. Should Manila and Manila Water refuse to accept the new agreements, the President will order the cancellation of their present water contracts, order the nationalization of water services in their respective areas of operation, and prosecuted, or the prosecute rather, all those involved directly or indirectly in the arrangement that led to the present suffering of the Filipino people. Note niya yung pideg, no? that there are three tons uh, consumption per week for the drug uh, problem in the Philippines, and then in equate niya ito doon sa drugs recovered. No? Yung appreciation niya doon sa statistics na yon is wrong. Right now, we are not encouraging them to travel to Australia, but uh, we are hoping that this is just a temporary situation, and uh, when things settle down and uh, things are restored to normalcy. For sure, uh, they, for sure the same opportunities uh, will be present for them.